When it comes to internet intrigue, nothing gets the people going quite like cults. It's provocative. No, it's not. It's it gets gross. the people going. I mean, they have everything. Tyrannical leaders, faithful followers, weird rituals, and adult volleyball. And the latest it cult is Twin Flames Universe, or TFU. They're a new agey group centered around married YouTubers Jeff and Shalia Devine, who popularized the existing concept of twin flames, which are soulmates on spiritual steroids. Jeff and Shalia, if you're watching, come on stream sometime, you know, fellow YouTubers, just chopping it up, why not? They parlayed their platform into an online ascension school, where they charge $4,444 for their video courses, and up to $200 an hour for sacred heart coaching. All for the privilege of this. Welcome back to a special Halloween episode of Twin Flame Ascension School. Yeah. The group's methods escalated in shocking and disturbing ways, with what basically amounted to forced marriages and coerced gender transitions. Kieran was assigned as a divine masculine and was told to transition. They'd only chatted a few times, never met in person, and we're barely even acquaintances. Which are both no bueno. Two recent documentary series included testimony from followers who fell in deep, handing over their life savings, offering free labor, and giving their entire sense of self to the divines. Soon as he got home, would head down our basement and disappear for hours. But the thing that really threw us off is that these folks weren't spooky Mansonites. I'm the devil and I'm here to do the devil's business. Or way too happy Scientologists. Have you ever felt this way? <laughs> They're just kinda normal. So why do seemingly reasonable people fall for a half-baked, get-rich-quick scheme baked up by your Stone College roommate who took intro to religion? In other words, why and how did this cult succeed? What does that success say about its followers? Are they naive, ignorant? gullible because surely none of us would ever fall for this sort of thing right and guess what it results in heaven on earth for you and when you liberate yourself to follow your heart you're liberating others around you let's find out in this video cults why do people join them okay before we get into it i wanted to tell you about our patreon uh, if you've ever wanted to watch our videos early without ads i don't know maybe be on a discord server with other wisecrack fans maybe ask me questions and have me respond to them in video form things of that nature then you might like our Patreon. It really is the best way for you to directly support our channel so we're less dependent on advertisers and algorithms. So check it out, link in the description. Now, back to the show. Okay, just a quick note, experts interviewed in these docu-series identified Twin Flames tactics of abuse as meeting the accepted definition of a cult. Now we define cults in a previous video, check it out if you want, why not? Uh, but we're gonna trust the experts on this one. So let's start by clearing up some common misconceptions about folks who join cults, often painted as aimless drifters, dum-dums, or vulnerable victims lacking autonomy. But multiple long-term studies of cult members have concluded that they're typically significantly better educated than the average person. Usually young adults with weak religious backgrounds, their top motivation for joining, according to one study, were spirituality, personal development, and life dissatisfaction. A scholar Lauren Dawson notes, being converted to a cult requires flexible thinking and diligence, noting that the processes of being indoctrinated demand literate intelligence, a willingness to study, and a lack of fear in the face of unfamiliar concepts and language. That's how I felt when I first started taking improv classes, and like $15,000 later, here I am. So you have open-minded, intelligent folks seeking some form of religious or spiritual meaning, which is a problem they could probably cure with, a, with one nice acid trip, but who am I to judge or advise? Now, there's been well-educated, disillusioned young people ever since the first person turned 18, but not all societies are created equally cultish. Linguist Amanda Montel writes that society's attraction to so-called cults tends to thrive during periods of broader existential questioning. Most alternative religious leaders come to power not to exploit their followers, but instead to guide them through social and political turbulence. She points out that one messy-haired messiah's rise to spiritual acclaim occurred during the violent expansionism of the Roman Empire, which left people searching for a non-establishment guide who could inspire and protect them. Just in case you didn't get that and your parents were too cool to take you to church, 
Uh, we're talking about Jesus here. And because, you know, it's Christmas season, happy birthday, Jesus. During the tumultuous European Renaissance, Montel adds, dozens of cultish groups bubbled up in opposition to the Catholic Church. More recently, the turbulent and socially transformative 1960s and 70s saw a flowering of cultish groups that offered alternatives to the conformity of post-war Protestant America. According to writer Jeffrey Nelson, the central precondition for new religious movements is for establishment religions to lose their monopoly over spirituality. Or as sociologist Daniel Bell put it, where religions fail, cults appear. In other words, when we're really sick of the Catholic Church, we're more willing to shop at the uh, weird little gemstone and crystal pop-up down the street. And that's no judgment. Shout out to people that have crystals and gemstones that look really pretty. I don't know if they have powers, but I hope they do. If you have crystals you like, let me know in the comments. I think my next move is becoming a crystal guy. But you can't just throw a dart and make this work. A given cult is always a reflection of the culture it was born out of and all its preoccupations, needs, and priorities. Consider Scientology, which arose in the 1950s based on some lively science fiction. On its surface, it seems like a bizarre phenomenon, but a quick look at the cultural context is revealing. Founder L. Ron Hubbard's theory of Dianetics, which posits that you can erase the bad parts of your mind, effectively placed the budding psychotherapy craze of the era under a religious umbrella. This both reconciled potential contradictions between religion and therapy, while giving the increasingly popular quest for a healthy psyche some major spiritual stakes. At the same time, Scientology's pay-to-play model, which required members to purchase each step up the ladder of the religion, created what sociologist David Bromley calls a corporate religion where the spirit of capitalism and spiritual salvation are harmonized, where spiritual salvation can be earned and purchased. This is ideal for a consumption drunk, booming American economy, increasingly convinced it could buy its way to happiness. The merging of therapy, religion, and business cultures, researcher Renee Lockwood explains, made Scientology particularly attractive. Historian Robert Genter adds that Hubbard tapped into Cold War anxieties about America's waning security, while offering an optimistic way out that embraced a brand of modernism and personal autonomy at a time when folks still feared the former and lacked the latter. In other words, it was catnip for Cold War era Americans. But most of us probably don't feel like we're living through nuclear anxieties about the imminent end of the world. And might still be thinking that you have to be a special type of goof ass jabroni to end up giving thousands of dollars to this guy. Let's we'll start with who is your twin flame. Your twin flame is your ultimate lover, your perfect complement of all. I wouldn't give him a dollar. To better understand the appeal of cults, let's consider the concept of disenchantment, a term Max Weber popularized to describe modern secular British and American societies where rationality had supplanted magic and spirituality. Traced back to the Protestant Revolution, disenchantment reached a fever pitch as enlightenment rationality swept away any lingering holy cobwebs. Importantly, the logic of the market economy is a reflection of disenchantment, a construct of a society where, as Weber wrote, there are no mysterious forces that come into play. Rather, one can in principle master all things by calculation. Now, all this rationalism soon triggered pushback via the Romantic Revolution, which reemphasized feeling and mysticism. The push and pull between the supposed duality of the rational and scientific versus the emotional and mystical has been ongoing since. While some still consider our world disenchanted, other scholars argue that over the second half of the 20th century and into the present, we've witnessed a re-enchantment of society, which reflects a deeper critique of modernity. That's true even as, paradoxically, society continues to become more secularized, science and rationalism ever more revered. Crucially, re-enchantment cropped up as organized religion was declining in power power and influence. This means that it has, according to many scholars, taken place largely on the fringes. It's helpful to think of the re-enchantment of some aspects of life as an active rebellion against the disenchantment we experience on a daily basis. So when examining the power of a cult, it makes sense to ask, what do they offer in the way of re-enchantment? When it comes to Twin Flames universe, the answer is clear. TFU is centered on the ideal of finding everlasting, transcendent, enchanted romantic love. To understand the appeal of that pitch, consider sociologist Eva Iluz's argument about why modern romance sucks. Iluz argues that especially with the surge in dating app use, those looking for love are faced with a new problem, a total overabundance of choice. Effectively, she explains, these apps turn dating into a marketplace, leaving folks with the romantic equivalent of picking between 40 different toothpastes, except that toothpaste might ditch you at the bar while you're in the bathroom. Okay, let me know in the comments if any of you have ever been on a date where you straight up ghosted and, and like just left when someone went to the bathroom. 
let us know, no judgment. It's a bold move. I just wanna know if it's a thing people actually do. In other words, the disenchanted rationality of the marketplace has been extended to romance. This, Illuz argues, causes choice paralysis, which manifests as ambivalence, insecurity, and a reluctance to commit, turning the quest for love into an agonizingly difficult experience. This is a bummer, especially at a time when, as she writes, love is more than a cultural ideal. It is a social foundation for the self. Increased prioritization of romantic partnership as the end-all be-all means success at love comes to define our very identities, offering us validation and self-worth. Failure to find love, in contrast, makes us feel worthless. This is especially true for women who, Illuz argues, have been primed to bear a greater share of the psychic burden for the success of a relationship. Given that last point, it doesn't feel like a coincidence that Twin Flames was overwhelmingly populated by people who identified as women at the time they joined. Now, Jesus Jeff effectively promised to re-enchant romantic love, guaranteeing you'll find the other half to your whole, a transcendental soulmate instead of a never-ending slideshow of people who love travel and are both introverts and extroverts. What's more, it did so by taking away the pressure to choose. You can't choose your twin flame after all, which removes anxiety about choosing wrong. Especially once the divines started actively pairing people up with their assigned twin flames, the promise became even more definitive. You can have all the success and salvation of everlasting romantic love without the doubt, pain, and rejection that constitutes modern dating. Now, in case you didn't watch these movies, these pairings were quite literally these two jamokes pointing at two folks in a Zoom chat and being like, yep, yeah, you two, meant, meant for eternal love. You never met before? Oh, it's fine. Move in, with, move in with each other. Yeah, you fly over and move in with them. They did that. They just moved in with these people that they didn't even, they didn't even know. It's wild. Further, the divines insist that if your twin flame relationship isn't working, it's your fault. This led some people to end up in jail. Yeah, I said that right. They ended up in jail for stalking their twin flames, even after being served restraining orders. Because these people were like, hey, Jesus Jeff, I thought this guy was my twin flame, but he got a legal restraining order. And Jesus Jeff was like, don't give up, coward. And they went to jail. But you know, love hurts. This burden of blame matches other pressures we all feel in romantic relationships. Eluz argues that the mainstreaming of clinical psychology has established the belief that our romantic misery is a function of our psychological failings. While therapy is awesome, this reductive framing tells us that when love doesn't work, it's because we didn't fully work through our shit on Dr. Osborne's couch. That sense of fault is further embedded in the twin flames mirroring exercises. Learn in this short video how to heal your upsets by loving yourself using the mirror exercise taught by Jeff and Shalia Yan. Now this is like their main thing. So the mirroring exercise would be if I thought to myself, my wife doesn't love me, but then I mirror it and I say, I don't love myself. If I was gonna say like, my colleagues don't take me seriously, I don't take myself seriously. And while it's legit to take responsibility for the way that we sometimes project our own anxieties onto our partners, the mirroring exercise takes it to the extreme. I am upset at myself because I am rejecting myself. Basically, any complaint or problem you have with anyone else is really just your own issue. So rather than saying, the murderer is trying to murder me, please help. We must say, I am trying to murder myself please help. This method worked. Members felt responsible for the romantic malaise and thus were probably more likely to sign up for another class to learn how to love good. TFU's compelling promise to re-enchant romance for eternal happiness provides a need in a dating market that sucks while pretending to empower people with the tools to maintain that happiness. So the success of TFU at least makes some sense. But guys, there's still a couple things that don't make sense. The leaders attracted an insanely loyal, enormous following all while one being deeply uncharismatic and two doing it all via Facebook posts and Zoom calls. And while this is going to sound as dumb as casually announcing that you are Jesus, I'm banging the Christ. <laughs> we think it could be the case that they succeeded precisely because they were uncharismatic completely online. To explain, we got to address a paradox in the whole re-enchantment narrative. While we associate technology 
with science and rationalism, it's actually played a huge role in re-enchanting our contemporary world. As historian David Noble argues, present enchantment with things technological is rooted in religious myths and ancient imaginings. Although today's technologists seem to set society's standard for rationality, they are driven also by distant dreams, spiritual yearnings, for supernatural redemption. Their ultimate goal, he says, nothing less than transcendence and salvation. Whether it's AI creators promising us the potential to live forever in lines of data, or genetic engineers inviting parents to customize their baby's eye color, once you think about it, it's impossible to ignore what scholar Eric Davis calls the mystical impulses behind our society's obsession with technology. Anecdotally, it's no wonder that Steve Jobs designed Apple stores to evoke the sensation of entering church. Noble argues that religious progress has long been associated with the human quest for divine perfection. And that as far back as the medieval ages, technology took on new significance, not only as evidence of grace, but as a means of preparation for and a sure sign of imminent salvation. For Davis, technologies of communication are particularly mystical because the ideas and experiences of the sacred have always informed human communication. You can think of stone tablets or medieval manuscripts as early examples. Davis argues that with every new device for communication, we partially reconstruct the self and its world, whether we're writing in our papyrus diary or streaming Baldur's Gate 3. You're free to make your own choices. Your own stupid, stupid choices. The internet reconstructed our notions of our place in time and space, allowing us to inhabit what John Perry Barlow described as a world that is both everywhere and nowhere. Fun fact, John Perry Barlow is one of the lyricists from The Grateful Dead, I'm also a cattle rancher and a cyber libertarian political activist. Let me know your favorite John Perry Barlow penned song in the comments. Now, Barlow whimsically calls this disembodied dimension a civilization of the mind. And those who created that landscape, Noble Notes, dreamt of offering us no less than godlike omnipresence and disembodied perfection. As one 1970s virtual reality researcher put it, we will all become angels, and for eternity, cyberspace will feel like paradise. The collapse of time and space enabled by modern technology may feel banal and unremarkable, but when you really think about it, the transcendental traces are hard to ignore. And it's no wonder Timothy Leary called the PC the the LSD of the 1990s. And an already mystical medium is prime territory for conveying mystical ideas. Which brings us to religion on the internet. Now, every technology spreads religion in new ways. The printing press allowed Protestant Christianity to spread to the common folk who previously had little access to religious texts. Spirituality on the internet looks very different. Its distinct lack of hierarchy, fragmentation, hyper-personalization, and bonkers diversity of thought makes it a place for what religious scholar Tara Burton calls religions of anti-institutional, intuitional, self divinization. That is to say, our spirituality becomes increasingly centered around this self-knowing individual. Or in the case of Twin Flames, the self and whichever random person in a Zoom call the divines tell you to date for eternity. Now the catch is, religion that proliferates online functions by the same market logic of all digital spaces, where cult-like consumer loyalty is sought by yoga companies, therapist influencers, and everyone in between. We increasingly live in what Davis calls the metaphysical economy, where consciousness is the real source of wealth. And cults are just one more string of data competing for our eyeballs. In a way, it's almost too on the nose to watch a YouTube cult leader beg you to feel free to subscribe to our videos, hit that notification bell because you never know when we're gonna come out with another video, you wanna be notified. Don't wanna miss them. Now this feels like the logical extent of the buzzfeedification of the internet, or as writer Elliot Rayal puts it, we're entering an era of cults funded by clicks. Cults for content. Suddenly it makes sense that the best cult leader of the internet age is someone who gleefully proclaims that. So what we found out when we were doing card readings and talking to Divine Mother is that our sex is a tool for our ascension. As is the case with so many influencers, the internet cult leader doesn't necessarily have to be super charismatic. They simply need to be the most shocking and weird person to win the competition for your attention. The second coming of Christ who you just can't look away from. There's a certain depressing logic to effectively trolling your way to cult leadership. And this is why it shouldn't surprise us that before he was developing sandwich recipes. How about that? That's a sandwich. Forcefully suggesting you switch genders. And so when I hear Jeff and Shalia tell people, 
you must do it the way that I believe that gender should be expressed, that that is about control, that's about power. Or announcing that he's God's other son. I pulled up a recent image of myself and put it next to that image of, you know, the supposed Jesus, and uh, it's, it's, this, it's the same person. Jeff Devine was an aspiring tech entrepreneur who spent his teen years obsessing over Warren Buffett. Now, to his credit, and seriously, I, I really hate to give this guy credit for anything, he was able to clearly see a path for using digital space to synthesize the religion of the digital economy with our collective thirst for love and spiritual fulfillment. Given how freely the word cult is applied to products ranging from moisturizers to Amazon jackets, it's not surprising to hear that major brands ranging from MLMs to gyms have been sampling the tactics of cults for years. The title of the 2004 business advice book, The Culting of Brands, When Customers Become True Believers, made the connection explicit. I was laughing as I said that title because it was hard to say seriously. These tactics have only accelerated since. As journalist Jarrett Fuller writes, especially in this social media age, these differences between guru and salesperson, influencer and profit, brand builder and cult leader fade away. In a landscape where we're being advertised to constantly, we're forever on the precipice of being recruited into a community centered around beard waxes or video games. Which means that even for those of us unwilling to pay thousands of dollars to have two absolute tools randomly assign us a soulmate on a Zoom call, we're still ducking and weaving through various cult-like brands, influencers, and communities every time we pick up our phones or open our laptops. <laughs> it almost makes traditional religion seem pretty chill. And even if they are bitten, their belief is God will heal them. Almost, I said almost pretty chill, almost. What do you guys think? Is the internet perfectly ripe for new and weirder cults? Can reasonable humans give their time and money over to seemingly illogical groups? Or is this just the current version of a sucker is born every minute business tactics? Let us know what you think in the comments. I wanna give a special shout out to all of our patrons who aren't in a cult, but if you wanted to join our not cult, there's a link in the description. It's a great way to support the channel. You get videos early without ads, extra content, things of that nature, all while not being in a cult. Although you also get on our Discord server where you can ask me questions directly. I could give you advice, spiritual guidance, but it's not a cult. So check it out, link in the description. But for those of you not wanting to commit your lives to us, thanks so much for just being here, for giving us your time, your attention, for, for clicking things, for leaving comments, all the stuff. We really appreciate it. We hope we're making it worth your while. And we'll hope you come back next time. Uh, between now and then, try to not join any cults. But if you do, I don't know, let us know how it goes. I'll see you next time.